had this sort of people don't want to prove Joe Rogan is a rebel crime bull or should be rationalized. We don't actually end up proving anything, but that still counts as deep in the sense that you're looking for. Um, yeah. Yes, I'm not sure what the answer to that is, but mode of inquiry versus theorem is cer certainly the way mathematics often operates. For instance, the classification of finite single groups, no one knew in advance what the state of the theorem was going to be. They, they just explored uh, different kinds of groups. Um, first of all, getting the, the main infinite families, the alternative groups, the groups of Lie type, and then the, the inquiry was what's left, and people didn't know. And during the 1960s, people searched and found certain examples. Uh, and it took a long time to discover that the list was complete. So it was more uh, a mathematical investigation rather than attempting to prove a theorem in that case. Um, I don't know how close that comes to <laughs> answering your question. Yeah, it's difficult. Um, so I think I guess I'm sort of trying to get a little bit at why maybe some of these things that seem um, in, in the sense that you were saying before, like that's not deep, that's just a long list of unfortunately um, <laughs> not unified things. Um, but what what is deep about it is this sort of um, fact that it opens up a lot of Yes, um, yes. And the, the search was literally deep. It, it was a hard like thing to search for. sense that the two talks this morning were going in directly opposite directions. Mm -hmm. um, one kind of from the end looking back to the history and one James talk from the end looking forward into the future. Uh, I mean, John, you were talking about uh, theorem taking a long time to prove and the proofs involving concepts outside of the theorem and it took a lot of mathematical achievements to prove it and I would have thought something could become deep that way only if it came from things that were, as it were, really deep. We talked about standing on the shoulder of the giants. Uh, the giants, right? Uh, so the, so the result gets to be deep because it's standing on deep things. And where do those things oh. get to be deep from? Well, well it's like Jamie's talk, right? It's fruitfulness that it produces all of these powerful results is part of what makes it. But of course the results have to be powerful. Anything that anything can prove can be the, 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 the premise for proving a lot of so shallow results, but it's getting deep results out of it that make it deep. And so I feel like you need deep premises to get deep um, conclusions and deep conclusions to get deep premises. So you might say that the piano, the piano axioms are deep because they, they imply theorems such as I mean, fruitfulness yeah. is, if fruitfulness produces death, then it's kind of, you know, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And then if standing on the shoulders of giants produces death, then you the giants independent. Um, and I'm, yeah, I, I feel like there's a kind of incestuous circle. Uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't mean to claim that uh, every deep theorem rests on another deep theorem. It, it, well, it rests on something a little less deep and shallower and shallower until you get back to something. Uh, but to cut the story shorter, I, I concentrated mainly on big steps from previously big theorems. But I, I could have started with the Euclid's axioms or something, built up very gradually. Uh, I, I think there is a great depth is something that increases, sometimes in big steps, but in the beginning it's, it's quite shallow. You have small departures from shallowness like the step from the area of the triangle to the volume of the triangle. 
by a giant but it's extending the direction of the greater gap. So I wonder, maybe I'll step in myself for a second. So um, one thing that, that strikes me in connection with both John's talk and, and Jamie's talk is, is question two regarding the kinds of features cited in defense of examples. And so with Jamie, you came up particularly with Jeremy Heiss's question in connection to with the Galois theory and the theory of Riemann surfaces. And it sounded like the, uh, the kind of thing that was being cited here was that both of these were examples of uh, mathematical theories that connect up many different areas of mathematics um, that in some sense um, show up everywhere in surprising places. And, um, John, I, I got, I mean, I, I think there was, a, there was a different sort of perspective, but it was a, there, there was something similar going on in the kinds of evidence you were citing in the sense that many of these very difficult theorems were proved, I think at one point you said, by drawing on resources that you wouldn't have expected to need to use, and in many cases required the development of new math from very different, apparently different areas. And so in both cases, I mean, I think these are pretty different in, in many ways, but there's a kind of commonality. Yeah, that, that we were also talking about greater reach, yeah. greater breadth as well as depth. So I wonder if either of you would like to comment on that. Well, I, there's one thing I was going to mention that this relevant in connection with John's talk because there's there were two uh, I mean among the many different great things in it uh, were uh, two ideas one is this idea you're, you're pointing to of, of, of showing up in different places um, unexpected you know which is kind of a qualitative feature of uh, of the phenomenon you're saying well you know, to us right these sort of things which are you know Things which uh, have are, are invariant under certain kinds of permutations, you'd say, well, those are you know they're geometrical, right? The, or we're going to count these things as, as, as sort of what counts as geometrical. These other things, well, we tend to classify them differently, and so we're surprised when there are these links. Um, but you might say that that's kind of a feature of the way we think about these things, right? Where there's a sense where, where, where there are certain limits to our cognitive capacities. We Parts of having those limits is to classify things in, in certain ways, and then part of being deep is for something to cut across those classifications. Um, whereas, if you know, for one of these imagina imaginary creatures that you know philosophers or you know philosophers of mathematics will sometimes mention that, that are somehow logically omniscient, that can you know, deduce all the consequences of uh, the, their assumptions. Um, then that 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 classification of, of being deep wouldn't necessarily mean anything to, to a creature of that type, right? There's you have to begin with that there are certain limitations on how we can how we can think and how we can find things natural and how we can classify them, and one of the ways we identify things being deep is just cutting across, right? So that the reason I mention that is that that for example the the, the Friedman program. Right, is one where, although that's extremely revealing and, and gives another point of view on things that can count as deep, um, it's, uh, it, it, it might end up you know, cutting, the, you know, it might end up drawing, drawing, the, uh, drawing the boundaries in a slightly different way uh, because it turns out to be there are specific axioms and you're just talking about provable equivalence. So you have the, you know, the Kruskal's thing. Since you know the since Martin Kruskal was uh, in the well, in the math department when I was in graduate school, it was called the Kruskal's brothers' theorem. Um, but you know, the Kruskal's brothers' theorem is equivalently equivalent to what is it, ACA zero? Is that the one? I can't remember which axiom it is. Anyway, whichever one it is, I mean that's sort of a, that you can say. Well, that turns out to show that there's from this kind of proof theory, uh, kind of proof theory point of view, it is deeper in some sense or, or more profound, it's more powerful certainly than um, the Bolsonaro Bar structure. Um, yeah, I, I may be giving examples yeah, specifically. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but there's going to be these cases where you can make these distinctions, they're extremely revealing, they're very illuminating. Right? There's all sorts of things you learn from them. Um, 
But the one thing they might not shed light on as much is the idea of being deep, where something's being deep means it cuts across classifications. Right? It's sort of say, well, it shows up in topology here, and it shows up in, you know, so the fact that, you know, the fact that the compactness theorem is equivalent to the, um, for corrective logic is equivalent to the, the uh, Chibinoff theorem in, in uh, for uh, compact outdoor spaces, you know, in the sense that, you know, the, the system that Friedman, the, the system that sets the, the classifications for Friedman's program doesn't distinguish those two things as far as that sense of, of depth or profundity of power. But for people who think like us, it's, it's huge, right? It's, it's, an, it's an astonishing uh, connection between two apparently distinct things. Um, so I just wanted to mention all the, that, that there might be two different ideas here. One, one that the Friedman program is tracking relative to which having cognitive limitations at least you know the ability to make arbitrarily long production matters or it doesn't matter and one like the way we kind of think where those limitations do, do yeah, do yeah I, would, I would expect that the Friedman program or other, other ideas from logic are only going to give a course classification of yeah. I just want to put a word in again so I think it might go retrospective depth. We shouldn't have this bad idea. Uh, by which I mean that we look back at a piece of mathematics and we say, wow, that's deep. Uh, when it hadn't been thought to be. And I have in mind the proof of the infinity of prime. Now, my problem with the proof of the infinity of prime is it's a very short proof. And we can speculate as to whether this blew anybody's mind when you could wrote it down, but we've no idea. Okay. What you could didn't have was what we like about primes really, which is that you've got the uniqueness of the fact that they zero. Right. So I think we ought to be a little bit careful about what we're regarding as depth. And to raise a question now is this can it be deep if it has a very short and if you had a deep theorem, let's say the free space theorem on the infinity of primes, which I think is wonderfully deep, what would we do if some smart guy came up with a <laughs> three page proof, right? Based on some you know, lovely ideas, several giants have been stood one ruthlessly, <laughs> yeah, but nonetheless, actually, it's a very short proof. And you read it and you go, yeah, you'd have another background theory, but gee, we never put it together like that. Yeah, I, I think we'd have to change our minds in, in, that, in that case, but I'd be very impressed. <laughs> 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 but, but wouldn't it be deep? Uh, so um, it, it, it depends. Sometimes we've just missed some obvious connection, right. and so you get a very short proof because, oh yes, of course that was there, and you know, I think it's what happened to all of us in graduate school. We spent a lot of time trying to develop a proof of something, and then somebody who's cleverer than us comes in, oh, it's just because the reals are first countable. Oh, yeah, yeah okay. And so in that sense, those things are, are clearly not deep. But it seems to me that if what that very short proof does is it's making connection between this piece of mathematics, which is where that theorem with its very long proof had resided, and right. some other piece of mathematics and making that connection, uh, it's far from clear to me that it's giving a short proof means that it's not a deep But then, theorem. well, I like that, but then I think what you're saying is that, oh, these deep connections, these hidden deep connections, and that's yeah. one thing. Then there are some deep results. They just seem to require a more form of work. And then, was it your point? I'm sorry, I'm bad on basis. Was it your point earlier on that we have deep methodologies, deep approaches, right? The diagonalization argument should should work lots of times and if you've got a problem where it's remotely relevant, try it out, right? Which I've quickly said wrong. Um, there might be different senses of deep, right? But listening to John's talk, I kept thinking, I kept going back to the purely subjective sense we have, which is why I'm, I'm wondering what would we do, you know, what would we do when something we consider deep turns out to be easy from another point of view, and as it therefore you know, relates to these 
questions here. Did, was it really deep, or was it something about us? Not just necessarily we missed it, right? But is it, is it a context-dependent thing that it's just deep right now? Has been deep for a couple of hundred years. Yeah, I, I, I worry about that. But um, and, until a really convincing counterexample comes along, I think I'll continue believing that <laughs> these things are deep. Well, the canto of proof of existence of transcendentals, that was, in a sense, uh, proving something was easier than people thought. But it was only giving existence. It wasn't giving any of the interesting examples about being or hot. But then what was known already is the Eucalyptus theorem, that's exactly the same feature. It doesn't give you the interesting ones, but it does uh, give you the is not Maybe but what's deep either. then is, uh, is really the idea. It's an improvement on the Eucalyptus, I would say. Okay, I'm talking this guy, not Charles. <laughs> Alistair. Yeah, I, I, I kind of think this idea that um, you know theorems with short proofs can't be deep is a, is a prejudice. <laughs> uh, and that, I mean, at least if you look back in, at, at ancient times, you'll see that both Aristotle and Plato seem to have thought that the um, irrationality proofs were deep. If you look at the beginning of the Theotetus, uh, Plato says, okay, here's this mathematician who's proved all these numbers to be irrational, and he clearly thinks this is a major mathematical accomplishment, and he thinks this is a deep proof, and, and Aristotle tends to call it, it, you know, like Aristotle's attitude towards the irrationality of the square root of two is, it, it's a little bit like, you know, people's attitude to Gödel's theorem these days, you know, this is this amazing result, you know, this is great. And nowadays, I, I guess we're, we're inclined to think it's, it's not deep, but, um, you know, there's certainly, I think these, you have sharp proofs, right? But uh, I, I think they were thought to be deep, at least in classical times, if, if not now. But uh, of course that, again, tends to show that depth is historically relative, I suppose. I don't know whether that's good or bad. I was just saying, the Bonnie, right? Yeah, I was just saying, I mean, the example of Bonnie Ray, uh, in, in connection with, with, with the six point theorem, uh, it serves as an example of that. It's, it's actually one that I use when not necessarily in connection with depth, although I will start using it in connection with depth now. <laughs> when, I, when I try to give my students an example of a proof that's really short but impossible to understand, um, is the recursion theorem. Right, cause the Gödel theorem, you can sort of see, okay, that's, that's hard, that's long, because you have to do all, you have to show things are representable and arithmetic, and you, you know, there's all this stuff, there's a, all this stuff that you have to do, and then the final diagonal addition quick, but there's this background. The recursion theorem, which is kind of the heart of that, just define recursive functions in <laughs> five lines, right? And that's proof, you know, the FNN theorem, of course. But there's not a lot that goes into proving the, the basic diagonalization fact. Um, that, depending on how you measure that, I'm sure you could cram it into, you know, half a page of not particularly small writing. Um, and yet, you know, this is an exceptionally deep fact crops up everywhere. Um, so I, I think um, uh, it, it might be that it's often the case that the, 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 the short proofs are assigned that something is, is, is superficial, but, but I don't think it's all of it. Uh, so, John, I, I have a question for you, uh, which is uh, really connected, I think, with what Pat was bringing up earlier. Um, so, your punchline seemed to be, well, your punchline was that, right, the, when we take a theorem, it's deep when we look back and we see all of these resources that we marshal on, on behalf of that, uh, the proof of the theorem, uh, all of the giants whose shoulders we're standing on. But when you when you went through the actual examples, I got a really, I got a different feeling and that was uh, that the moral here is that these examples are all deep insofar as they're like loci of mathematical practice, where people are, where mathematicians are putting in this work to develop new areas of mathematics or connect up other areas. So it isn't so much like looking back after we've proven the theorem. The theorem isn't so much so important, but rather it's all of the 
math that gets done on behalf of solving this problem. And I mean, that may just be a product of how you, you know, you, you told stories, like you took us through the history. Well, it's certainly the way I see it. Um, that um, people realize somehow that they've got to develop a whole lot of theory to solve certain problems. There's a, there's a quotation from Grothy, something to the effect that uh, he, s he sees a problem as a nut that he wants to dissolve and he has to develop, build a whole ocean first so that he can dissolve this <laughs> nut. And, and that, that's, that's a good metaphor for that. Yeah, that's, that's it. I, I really like that metaphor. Uh, but then my, my question is, how, to what extent is that kind of being a locus for mathematical practice something subjective, I guess, that this is just something that interests us and we're gonna we're gonna crack that nut. Right? So then we put all of our resources into um, that problem. Yeah, there, there, is, there is surely some element of fashion here, what, what happens to be fashionable. At a given time is what a lot of mathematicians will direct their, their energy, energy towards. But, um, but they, they, I, I particularly pick things that have been around for hundreds of years because they, they, that shows their durability. People have been interested in this for a long time. So it's, it's not merely a fashion. Uh, my phone went down. So something along those lines which worries me about Fermat's last term as a locus of mathematical practice, especially if we think it can be proven in PA, or something slightly stronger, then there's a sense in which it's historically accidental that it turns out to be a locus, right? If we, if we can prove it from, say, second order PA, right, then, then you get this worry about the depth being subjective because it's contingent on our methods of proving it, and so we didn't see the way of proving it in PA until we saw it how to prove it in these more complex um, Yeah, well, it, that's, that's true of a, a number of theorems. I, I forgot to mention, uh, in, in the case of the Dirichlet theorem, Dirichlet used analysis, but 100 years later, Silbo gave a so-called elementary proof that was just in PA. But people still favor the Dirichlet proof because it's somehow more insightful and more understandable, probably even shorter. Which, I mean, Suggest it's there's, there's something else going on here than just that we needed it to develop, to develop this right. It's it's this it's this understanding aspect of the methods that are employed that yeah. plays an important role. And so it, maybe it's again getting back to these deep connections that right you you lose the deep connections when you prove it when you yeah. get the elementary. The ele elementary proof. I, 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 I yeah I agree entirely that somehow higher order concepts and, uh, give insight into the theorem. And if you dispense with the higher order concepts, you have an incomprehensible proof. Mm, this is a particularly nice example, too, because you know, as Pat Beauty showed, you can formulate system of number theory that for which the um, uh, 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 analytic number theory can be formulated as a conservative extension. So you can start out with you, you, you have in, in anything you can do in the system using analytic number theories, anything like that, you know, you know the uh, Adam Arvin design, design results, you could have proven in the base system without the, uh, without complex numbers. Um, but that doesn't mean that there isn't something <laughs> fundamentally that, that conservative result, conservativeness result doesn't mean that there's nothing interesting about the extended system. In fact, I, I have the impression that um, depth often has to do with developing higher order concepts, and the depth is perhaps measured by the height of the concepts involved. For instance, a lot of the examples I gave, the real numbers make things a lot easier, and they motivate things. They motivate even classification of finite. Must be something in this. Pat, did you? Um, yeah, 
I think what's suggested, what we get from the higher concepts, right, what John was mentioning is right, it's the understanding, right? We, we feel like we understand more when we have the higher order proofs, and at least what I got from your description of the proof from the book is that the important thing is not the length there, it's the, the immediate understanding you get from seeing. When you see from the proof from the book, you don't just accept that it's true, right? You have a feeling, oh, okay, this is why God made it true, right? That's why it's in the book. And so I think... And sometimes you say, oh, that was obvious. Yeah. But I think it, right, it come, it's again through this, this understanding vein, which may, you know, it'll cut across things like proof length and things like that, but that's, that's going to be the important thing, right? Where the elementary proofs aren't going to be the proof from the book because no one can look at that and go, okay, obviously, sorry, that's the answer is true. You know, I got to understand how you're encoding these things that actually help me understand. Right? I, I well, think this is a potential the, misdirection. Uh, the case that was mentioned here, that if you then find out, oh, there is an elementary proof that is the right proof, that is the short proof, then what does that tell us? analysis that Picard did, right? Every internal function can omit at most two values. There's a very short proof using the elliptic modulus function, which is about half a page. But, you know, when I teach this in my complex analysis class, I'm always very unsatisfied uh, with this proof because it's short, leads to immediate understanding, but somehow it leaves you very dissatisfied because you don't really get a deeper insight what is going on. Uh, so that's also an issue that uh, sometimes happens I would say with, with uh, deep theorems that uh, so, so the, the theorem is deep enough if, if, if there are many uh, different perspectives of, of a certain uh, of the statement that you can look at and that's for example in the Picard theorem the case 
can't be. And if the short proof, I mean, it gives you a certain insight that somehow, you know, the other type of this one. Look, I mean, like, good comment, though, there's a way of spinning that. Maybe not for your class, but certainly not one that I. Which is what's deep is a two, right? Which is the other type of And now you're starting to say there are theorems which, you know, that it's the two that seems to be. I wouldn't say it's the two, it's rather, you know, the finiteness of the number. That's, that's the most important thing. Is, you know, we don't need finite many numbers. All right, it happens to be two, but, uh, yeah, it's yeah, it's two it's two the John's fault, right? It's two for a couple of them. There's only one, so that's interesting. Just to add to what I've been hearing, uh, I feel like for a given theorem, I feel like it's in the collection of all proofs, there's often a trade-off between the computational length of the proof conceptual depth, and uh, often we start out with um, a group which may be quite long, may have lots of cases, may not be too insightful, and then over time uh, we develop concepts which make it more understandable, which require less sort of computational length, and we have more conceptual depth. Um, and then maybe once you have that proof in the book, you could, um, if you were to sort of write everything out in terms of definitions and express it just in logic, then you would get to a very conceptually shallow proof, which was very computationally long. It's somehow there's this sweet spot there. And, um, I would, so I, I would suggest that uh, yeah, this is the depth of the sort of concepts and how we understand it, which is sort of that optimal proof. Yeah, I, I believe there's an actual example that Girard worked out on Van der Waals, on regressions, where there was Van der Waals common proof was, was the long one, and Wurstenberg um, used an ergodic theory or something for dynamical systems, which was shorter, and Girard found a way to unwind the Wurstenberg proof to get the Van der Waals proof. One is literally um, unwinding of the other. So, and so there, there's your increase in length really demonstrated. So we're, we're at the end of the allotted time for the uh, discussion. There's uh, lunch catered outside. Um, we'll start again at 2.45. And, uh, yeah.